give light. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. And that we can sing this, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you, because Romans 5, 8, but God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the reason we come together this morning, to sing and to worship and to magnify, it's because of the gospel. Even in our sin, we have a Savior who came so that we could live in freedom and be made right with God. 
So as we continue this morning, let's continue to think about the truth of the gospel, that we can come to the Father because the Son has given himself for us. crown 
bones before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. you are worthy. We don't come here because it's good for us, because it's fun for us, even though those are true things. We come and we worship and we hear your word because you are worthy of that. And so, Lord, may your name be exalted in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Before we begin, I just want to do 
we've got one this week, so all missional communities are back on this week as usual. If you're not part of a missional community and would like to be, then please speak to us at the end and we'll get you connected with one. Uh, missional communities are our small groups where we have a meal together, uh, we read the word and we pray together. Um, if you're not part of one yet, I encourage you to do so. Uh, throughout the week, we have a number of opportunities for us to come together as a church family in prayer, whether that is online or in person. And Stuart Mark will post this in, online in the, the uh, next couple of days. So both ESO and football are on this week too. If you imagine they are, yeah. If you need further information on this, then do speak to us at the end and we'll give you the details for that. Uh, big, news, big news this week in the life of TBC on Friday, Claire and Neil got engaged. <laughs> A massive congratulations to you both. And do pray for these guys over the next uh, coming months as they prepare and arrange for the wedding. So we as a church have been blessed and encouraged over the years by the faithful giving uh, of the people of the church. We've seen God use it for the furtherance of his kingdom. And as we look to the future of Dennis and Andrew, we're excited about what he will do. Uh, if you'd like to give to the life of DBC, uh, there are a number of ways you can do this, uh, whether it's by place, placing it in a bucket and be out, or by doing so online. If you would call DBC your home church, I'd ask that you prayerfully consider how much you'd give to the life of DBC. So before we pray, I just want to read from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. And on that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his name, make his works known among the peoples. Declare that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the earth. I thought that firstly, uh, we could just spend some time thanking the Lord and exalting his name. And that as we look at the different outreaches that we have during the week, um, that we would be a people who make his works known. Um, I'll leave some space for us to pray, and then I'll pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives, for your guidance and your continued blessings over us. We thank you for your deep love and care for us, Lord, and we ask that you would help us as a church and also as individuals to show this love to our community. As we participate in the different ministries and outreaches, that you would help us to remember that we are there to exalt your name, that we are there to declare who you are and all that you have done. Help us to do this in a way that honours you and gives you glory. We pray for salvation and transformation in our community. In your name. I thought we could just spend some time now praying for Claire and Neil, uh, praying firstly that God would be with them as they make plans and prepare for the wedding and that logistically everything would work out, uh, but also praying into their life as a couple and that God would be at the centre of all that they do. Again, I'll leave space for you guys to pray and then I'll pray. Lord, we thank you for both Claire and Neil. We thank you for who they both are and the servant hearts that they have to serve you and to put you first. Uh, we thank you that you, you have brought them together and you have seen your hand upon their life. Uh, we ask that you would be with them over the next coming months as they prepare everything that needs to be prepared for this wedding. That your hand would be upon every step and there would be no complications. We ask that they would put you at the centre of their lives and their marriage and follow you wherever you may lead them and do them well. In your name. Thought that we can now spend some time just thanking God for his faithfulness in our finances, that he would continue uh, to lead us in this uh, and guide us in this as we look to quite a busy year ahead. So again, take some time uh, to pray and then I'll pray.
Paul, thanks for your, your introduction to Hingham's lesson. It was a great learning experience for, for your finances. Um, but as we have needed you, you have fulfilled our every requirement. We ask that as the energy looks to this year, you see the mountain before us that you would give us the wisdom, the guidance, and ultimately the finances that you require to ensure that we can get everything done that is required. That we would firmly keep our eyes fixed on you and that know that you are with us every step of the way. Lord, I now pray that you would be with TJ as he shares your word, that you would give him boldness and that he would be led by your spirit this morning. Open our hearts to what you have to say this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, it is so good to be here back with you guys. Our family, uh, if you don't know, uh, just spent a, what was supposed to be six months away in the States in a time of connecting with churches and telling the story of all that God's doing here and still kind of leading and investing our team here, but ended up being closer to seven months away. And so we are so glad to be back and to be back with you. Uh, we missed you, we're so, we're, we're so good. It's been so good for so many of you to come up and just to tell us how much we were missed while we were away, but let me tell you, the feeling is def was definitely mutual. Uh, and so uh, th there's just something really special about the fellowship that we have as, as a church community, and, uh, and we, we missed that while we were away. So it's so good to be back. And it's, it's been a while since I've had the privilege to stand here and to preach and to, to, to just deliver God's, God's Word. And so I'm excited for us this morning as we, we focus on the passage we're going to look at. And we're going to be dipping back into our series on 1 Corinthians that we've been working on for, for some time. If you've been with us, You've been on the ride for a while now, and we're going on, on almost two years now, isn't that right? About two years of the First Corinthians. It was the Gospel of Mark before that. You know, we've we've been on a trek. You know, and uh, so we're 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 just plowing through. And and this this series is entitled "Gifted Unity." That's what this whole ser series has been about. And in the autumn, you looked at how God has given the church gifts, spiritual gifts for the equipping of the body, for the, for the building up of the body, for, for the enabling of the body of Christ to be about the task to which he is called, to proclaim the message of truth and then to make disciples. And then you looked at how uh, God has given different roles and leaders to the church. And, and then right after Christmas, we looked at Ephesians 6 and, and really the, the idea of spiritual warfare and God has given us armor. And last Sunday, we looked at how uh, we have a membership covenant and how the church is a gift to us and how we are covenant people together on mission together. And, and all of those things, as it seems, have kind of come to a head to, to, for the perfect time for us to go back into God's Word for what we're going to look at today. Uh, because amazingly, all of that flows into where we're headed this morning. And we pick things back up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn with me. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. It's a passage that is often read at weddings, and many over the years have referred to this passage as the benchmark for what love is to be, for what love is to look like, particularly, and I always have difficulty with that word, particularly, with, uh, in romantic relationships. But don't worry, this is not a series or a sermon on the how-tos of romantic relationships. You can, you can breathe the sigh of relief, some of you in the room. Uh, I think we're actually, Mark and I were talking about this morning, I think we're actually doing okay in that department because in the seven months we were gone, there were three weddings, one engaged couple, I think two engaged couples actually, and then this just this weekend, another engaged couple. I think we're, we're doing all right uh, on, on, in that department, but uh, instead we're going to have the opportunity to kind of pull everything together we've been talking about in the autumn uh, series and then in the January series. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1.13 in a sermon entitled, Love, God's Never-Ending Gift to the Church. So let's look at this chapter together, and then we'll examine some of what I believe God has to say to us today. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know, for na- uh, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Amen. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Several years ago, I was uh, pastoring a church back in the States. Uh, and as it so happened, as, as happened many times over the years, a, a young couple came to, in our church to me, and uh, an engaged couple, and they asked me to officiate their wedding. And I, it was my joy, my delight to do that. And so uh, as, after we had kind of walked through a bit of premarital counseling, Dean and I had, had the privilege of sitting down and doing that with them. We, we gathered together to talk about what, let's talk about the details of the actual ceremony itself. And uh, these dear friends of ours, I remember the bride saying, you know, we really want this wedding to really reflect who we are and to, to be kind of really more unique to our personalities. And we want it to be kind of original. And so I know that 1 Corinthians 13 passage is always read. So we just want really kind of something fresh and new and and uh, we, we just don't want that same old passage in 1 Corinthians 13. And while I understood the sentiment of what they were trying to say, I ended up reading the passage anyway. Uh, why? Because of tradition? Is that, is it a tradition? No. Uh, but because in this passage, we have the benchmark for, for what Christ-like sacrificial love looks like. And especially directed towards the church community. And, and when we know this in Scripture... Marriage is meant to be a picture of the sacrificial love that Christ has for his bride, the church. And so in this, this passage is an important component when you think about marriage. And we don't change our definitions uh, just because they, especially from the word of God, because they, we feel like they're a little outdated or they're old or we've just read them many, many times. No, and last week we talked about this, that we are a people who love God's word. It's timeless truth. And, you know, we, we use the language that in it is, it is without error. There's no mixture of error within it. It is the perfect, enduring uh, word of God, the living and active truth. Uh, and it's, it's one of the things that we affirm as members. And, and maybe you're like my friends this morning, and maybe this passage is really familiar. Maybe you've, you've heard this passage your entire life, and you're like, oh, another one of these. I, I can't handle it. But let me challenge you this morning Let's look at this anew today. Let's, let's look at this with some fresh eyes and fresh hearts uh, to really consider how this impacts not only your life, but the life of our church family. So as we kind of walk through this and unpack this section, it's worth noting that this is a masterpiece of writing. It, it's really brilliant when you think about how Paul has done this. As he's writing this letter to this church, he is basically, this chapter is a parenthetical section. I mean, he has walked through chapter 12, and you looked at all the gifts and the things that he's talked about in chapter 12, and then he goes on to complete that thought in chapter 14, but sandwiched in between the two is where he just takes a pause, and he goes on this discourse, I mean, magnificent discourse of what love is. And I'm not going to reread all of chapter 12, but, but here's kind of what I mean. At the very end of chapter 12, Paul concludes the chapter with verses 29 and 31, and they say, And he's been talking about gifts. He's been talking about leaders. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Then in chapter 14, he he concludes that thought by saying in verse 1, pursue love. 
and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And what we're left in between those two statements is, is this unbelievable passage on the meaning of what love actually is. He doesn't just leave it there for us to assume. The most excellent way, pursue a better way, pursue love. Well, what does that mean to pursue love? Well, let me tell you, and I'll spend a whole chapter unpacking what it means. And it's helpful for us to remember Paul knows these people well. As you read through Acts, you find that Paul spent about 18 months living life every single day, life on life, with these people. So he's not writing to a faceless community of church that he's heard about. He's not just heard rumor about some things that might be going on. He, he is intimately acquainted with the personalities at play. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember they didn't really like each other even when I was there. <laughs> so he's, he's writing about issues that he knows about that he saw in action. He spent time. So uh, when he's writing, he's not writing to strangers. He's writing this letter to bring correction and exhortation to them about a few things. And most of it stems from one issue that this church had. If you've been with us this whole two-year journey in 1 Corinthians, you might remember that we talked about this, that this church mightily struggled. They had an unhealthy emphasis on what others thought about them. That was at the root of all these problems and issues that we've looked at. Uh, it, prestige and respect were a stumbling block for them. It, it's why we saw sections earlier on uh, uh, about fractures that had occurred in the church because they were following after kind of the global church leaders because they thought it, it might get them something. Well, you, I follow Apollos. I follow Paul. I follow Peter. I follow Jesus. You know, it's like there, were, there was contention based on what they, the prestige that they wanted, the respect that they were seeking after. And, and all of this was because they thought it gained them something within the church, place within the church. It, it gained them something to align themselves. So when we get to this section on gifts in the church in chapter 12, this issue is, a, is, is as much about how the people thought a certain gift would make them look to the rest of the church as it was about following Christ, for some reason they believe that specific gifts made you more sp spiritual than other gifts. Well, I speak in tongues. Well, I, I, I give prophecies. I got the gift of healing. You know, and, and it was like this rivalry, this unhealthy thing. And that's why we see Paul write this at the end of 12 and launch off, pursue a more excellent way than that. Pursue a better way than that. And let me tell you what that way is. I will show you in even better ways what he says. The way of love is better than, than any of trying to gain status or prestige from others as it pertains to your role in the church. And that's why our passage begins with verse 1. If I speak in human tongues or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can just move mountains and don't have love, I have nothing. <laughs> I am nothing. And if I give away everything, all my possessions, and I, I give over my body even in order to, to boast but do not have love, I have nothing. Here, are, he, he's writing to try to help the reader understand just how incompatible the Christian life is without love. It, they don't fit together. The, those are two linked things. The Christian life is a life of love. You can't separate the two. He says that whether I use any spiritual gift to speak in any known or unknown tongue, even if it's a language that angels themselves speak, <laughs> and, and I'm not one who is marked by love, that my gift is absolutely useless. It's, it's simply useless noise like a gong or clashing cymbal. One commentary I read described the mention of these instruments in this way. They're instruments that produce a variety of sounds to command attention, but only frustrate the audience unless accompanied by music or words that interpret their meaning. I thought that was fascinating. A few years ago, I, I don't, you may have seen this viral video that went around. I, I saw that uh, it was of a, of a worship service where the, the worship leader uh, is very... The, uh, very, a time of prayer, it's very contemplative, and start off by playing the piano, and they're singing the song, the worship song, Oceans, a hill song. And, uh, and 
which is a powerful song, and it's really a, a, a deep song. And the worship leader launches off into the verse, and you know, she's leading the congregation, and it is a powerful moment of the church singing together, only to get to the end of the verse and the drummer realizing that this is his moment of all moments, the moment he has been waiting for his whole entire life to lay down the loudest, the most heavy metal rock beat that he has ever heard in his life, and he just goes for it. So we go from very prayerful, meditative, and I will call on your name, you know, and keep my eyes, uh, you know, not on the waves, but I'll keep my eyes on you, you know, and then all of a sudden the drummer just goes for it. And, and, uh, and it, it, across the board, the response was either laughter or horror or maybe a combination of both. And that's because of how out of place that moment the drummer took, you know, seized <laughs> was. And here Paul's trying to illustrate that trying to use any spiritual gift that is given to you by, through God's Spirit, in a way that's devoid of love, is completely out of place. And this extends to life action as well. If I live in such a way that I appear to pursue asceticism to the point that I just give away all my possessions, uh, and, and yet I'm not one who's marked by love, it's meaningless. And those two things really summarize what I believe Paul is trying to say here. Number one, love is meant to be part of our identity. It's who we are. Our whole selves, down to our core, this is who we are. Why, though? Why is that to be? Well, it's because that's who God is. Verse 2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, I have all faith that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. That's what he says. I am nothing. Like me as a person, I'm nothing. We've, we've just talked about all the identity issues this church had, but particularly when it comes to wanting others to, to think highly of them. But he writes this because he's reiterating that at the center of our identity, as followers of Jesus, we are to be marked by love. It's who we're to be because that's who God is. Secondly, love is meant to be the way or how we live. Verse 3 says, And if I give away all my possessions and I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. I gain nothing. Apart from the way of love, I get nothing out of it. Uh, the actions of my life, no matter how philanthropic or altruistic as they may seem, if they are not carried out from a heart that is full of love, they're worthless. They, are, they accomplish nothing. So, Paul tells us that our identity and our actions should be marked by love. And then he begins to expound on what the meaning of love actually is. So, let love be part of your identity. Let it be marked by your life. But just, just to be clear, here's what love is. And we get to verse 4 here. He says, love, then, is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, not self-seeking, is not irritable. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Man, there you go. He could just last on that one for a while, couldn't we? Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. God himself is love. We said that a moment ago. The Bible tells us that in 1 John chapter 4. This is going to be on the screen. In verse 7 of 1 John 4, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who has been born of God, everyone has been born of God, and uh, sorry, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is is love. I love how the Apostle John, he didn't just stop right there. He didn't just make that statement and leave it hanging. He unpacks why we know this is true. How do we know God's love? And verses 9 through 11 say, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. Commentator, scholar, author Craig Blomberg uh, puts it this way, love is what God in Christ has shown and done for others in their helpless plight and hapless estate as sinners. In love, we take God's side share his outlook, and implement his designs, and we treat our neighbors as we know God has treated us. Love that. 
Therefore, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, are really qualities that describe all that Christ has demonstrated himself to be to us. I mean, consider his love for you today. In that section, I mean, he consider how Christ has loved us. This is what it means that he loves you, that he is patient with you. He's patient with us. He's long-suffering in his love for us, even though he doesn't have to be. He's been kind to us, even when we reject him, we rebel against him, daily falling, daily going back to old things we shouldn't go back to. He's not arrogant or prideful because to be those things is to wrongly elevate yourself, and he rightly is above all things, yet he doesn't just work for his for just his good. He also works for our good. He is actually above all other things, yet works for us. In Christ, now, the Father does not look at you and see a record of all the things that you have done your whole life. He keeps no record of wrong, but in Christ, he looks at you and he sees beloved, chosen one, son and daughter. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, this morning, let's, let's jettison that thought, that thought that we so often go back to, thinking that in our fear that God is impatiently and frustratingly waiting for the day that you'll just finally get to the place that I'm calling you. Why don't you just get there already? That's how we picture God so often. We, we, can't, we cower in fear. Can't you just get your act together? selfish again today, God. Come on already. Let's get this. No, that's not how God looks at you. In Christ, if you have faith in Christ, he doesn't see that. He's not just waiting for you to get there, thinking that, really loving the version that you're going to be. He loves you right where you are. He loves you because when he sees you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, delight in that. Rejoice in that. Here's the mind-blowing truth of it all. God can't actually love you any more than he loves you in this moment. His love is so full and perfect because he sees the righteousness of Christ upon you that his love is full, infinitely full. He couldn't, he couldn't love you any more than he loves you in this moment. So rejoice in that today. Celebrate that in your heart today. Fight against those thoughts like we talked about in our last series with the truth that I am loved by God. I am beloved. I'm forgiven. All those things that I let have power over me, and all that shame of my past that I let back into my life, it's done on the cross. Now I am free. I am loved. I'll move on. Sorry. Uh, got a little, yeah, you said go on, abandon your notes, and just go there. I did that. So, uh, so he, he loves the church by bearing all things or, pers- or persevering in his love. So this is how Christ has proven that he loves the church. Secondly, but church, family, this is how we are to love one another. Do we? Do we love one another that way? I mean, these attributes we just read, they're depicting how we as a community love each other. But do we? Do we love each other this way? Do we love the world around us this way? Remember, this letter is addressed to a people. We read this as, as, and especially us Westerners, we read this as to me. (laughs) This is just to me. This is my individual personal devotion this letter to me. This was written to a church community, a people. First and foremost, we have to see this as a command to a church family, even more to the individual. But that being the case, we know that the church is made up of individuals, so we have to see it kind of on both levels here. Uh, we have to answer that question really in two ways. First, personally, are you someone who reflects these attributes, these characteristics in your life? Is this how our church family lives amongst our community during the week when we're scattered, when we're not together? Is this how we're living? Are you patient towards others? Who I've been grappling with that one this week, let me tell you. Uh, when you're running behind and you're wanting to get somewhere and you're stuck at the traffic light or the pedestrian caution sign and there's just someone lingering in front of you a little longer than you want them to linger, are you patient toward them? Are you loving toward them? Are you a kind to people, especially when it's hard? Not when it's easy, because that's, you know, but when it's hard, are you kind? Are you self-seeking, looking out for your own interests first and foremost? Are you irritable? Oof, that got me. Even before coffee or tea, 
<laughs> Are you irritable? Do you envy others, their life circumstances, the things they have, or even their season of life? New engagements, new weddings, new marriages, new children, new jobs. Are you envious of others? Are you patient in your love for your family or at home? Are your, your family, is that a source of, of frustration? Are you patient in your love for them and kind even then? This is the nature of love we're called to, though. The same love that Christ loves us with. Thirdly, is, is this how we as a church family act within the church to one another? Uh, look at verse 5 with me. It's talking about love. Love is not rude is not self-seeking, is not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs. Jesus told his disciples in John's gospel, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he says, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The way the world knows that we are his is by our love for each other here in this room. The way the world knows that, that we are marked by him is how we interact and how we demonstrate that love. However, have you ever been struck by the vast number of passages in the New Testament that actually talk about this, how to do this? I mean, there are loads of them. Uh, and the, the reason there's an abundance of these passages is because this is a really hard thing to do, to love one another well with this kind of 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. We are people that are unified in Christ. Yes, we are one in Christ as, as that bond holds us together. But let's not even think about globally. Let's just think about the room right here, how the, what we see in this room. I mean, we are a people who are from all over the world. You recognize from my accent? I'm not from here. There are others in the room who are not from here. We are, we are people from all over the world who have different experiences from different cultural backgrounds all over the world. We, we have different ethnic makeups, which the world says should divide us and not unite us. How many issues have we seen over the last couple of years related to that issue? We have different family backgrounds, family values based on how you grew up. Dean and I, when we did a lots of premarital counseling, we, we, a lot of the time was spent on the assumptions we bring to the table as two individuals wanting to become one. And the family, the way this family did things, the way this family did things, don't always just merge together. We all have different backgrounds that cause us to think a, diff, a, diff, a certain way. Those three components right there tell us that our default worldview or, or the lenses through which we interpret the world are very, very different. But then you consider the difference in personalities. We have some extroverts in here. I'll, yes, I know you're laughing at me. Yes, extroverts. We have some introverts in here. We we'll point no fingers because I know you don't want the finger pointed at you. Um, we have coffee drinkers. We have tea drinkers. We have, you know, young. We have less young or young-ish, however you want to say that. Young at heart, maybe. And the abundance or lack thereof of our life experience dictates the way we see the world and how we interact. With all those differences, it's no wonder that we see friction within the church. But in Christ, we are unified. We are one people. All of those differences actually add to who we are as the people of God. And, and that doesn't mean it isn't hard work to love one another. Listen to a few things that the New Testament says about this, which if you were at the DBC Life meeting may sound familiar. Uh, Mark and I were... We were literally pulling from the same playbook on, on that one. So uh, this is from Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look to, not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Flipping over to Paul's letter to the Colossian church, Colossians 3, verse 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, like a garment, man, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, 
bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love. I'm sensing a theme here. Put on love so that you are, uh, which is the perfect bond of unity. A couple other places. Peter talks about this in his letter. First Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. I love that. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. And then one other place we'll look, back to Paul, in his letter to the Galatian church, Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ... There is neither Jew, no, no, I'm sorry, for in Christ there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Uh, they neither accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. I put that in there because that's, I mean, that's who we are. It's talking about ethnically, the ethnic diversity. I mean, eth- who you are and your background does not accomplish anything for the kingdom. Instead, what matters is faith working through love who we are as a people together, our faith collectively working through love, working out that love in our community. Man, and those honestly are just a handful. We could do a deep dive and spend absolute hours on on this, on all the places that talk about this kind of thing. But there's one overarching thing that's implied there that's not not explicitly written out because there's, there's an implication here. There's something that needs to be happening. There's one thing that's required for us to truly love one another in a way that tells the world around us that we are Christ's disciples. And that is through our time and our presence. We have to actually be together for the world to know that we love one another and that we're his disciples. We can't love one another, bear with one another, be patient with one another, sacrifice for one another, forgive one another, and all those things that we've just read if we're not actually living life with one another. Being a community is more than just popping in on a Sunday morning, saying an obligatory hello and then leaving, only to repeat that process the following week. It means actually connecting with one another. I mean, for those of us that call DBC your church home and your church family, are you actually connecting to one another? Last week, perfect sermon on this, the membership covenant. We walked through what that looks like. These are the things we hold to be essential to life, and these are the things we covenant together. And and Mark really kind of pulled back the curtain, as it were, on what it looks like ideally to be a member of DBC. So if you call DBC your church family, have you taken the step to be a member? I mean, honestly, there's nothing magical that happens when you sign that membership document. But what it does is it signifies that you, you're in your heart, you are committing to be a part of this people. To God, Lord, I want to commit to be a part of a local church, but also I'm covenanting with this people to commit to them, to love them, to invest in them, to be about their welfare to be family together. What about outside of Sundays? Trust me, I know we're all busy. I know we're busy. We all are. But are you making connecting with your church family a priority in the week? Paul talked about missional communities. That's a great place to do that. Are you part of a missional community? Are you taking part in the prayer times that happen all throughout the week? Any of them. Are you checking in? Just not even in the organized times. How about just sending a text, a phone call, a visit? Hey, you want to grab a coffee this week? Is there any time? Are we connecting with one another? One of Jesus' greatest promises in the whole entire New Testament comes in his final words. And we always go to the Great Commission to, to, to go there for and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and then he says something at the very end. His final thing is, And lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. He promises his presence with us. What a better way to to reflect the love of Christ to one another than to to try to to be a picture of that with our presence with one another, spending time together. Uh, We're not like Jesus on a whole host of levels, but in some ways we can definitely be. 
we can be present with each other. Okay, we, we've seen that Paul emphasizes this benchmark love. That's the definition of who we are and how we should live. And we just saw him unpack kind of this comprehensive definition and, and description of what love looks like. Now let's look at the final portion of our passage this morning. Look down to verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Uh, when I became a man, I put aside childish things. Verse 12, for now we see only reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul brings it full circle really to this larger conversation, and he's getting ready to connect all of this to his conclusion in the next section in chapter 14. But, but the thing I want to highlight for us here is the eternality or the permanence of love. The permanence of love. If you go back and you reread the section on gifts in chapter 12, Paul's pointing out that, that every single one of these gifts, as good as they are, are temporary. And they are good gifts from God. Let's, let's make no mistake about that. But they're not going to be with us forever. But the love that we have experienced from God and that we're now striving to be and reflect to one another and the world around us will be with us forever. In Ephesians 4, uh, Paul says it another way that's really helpful for us. There he's explaining the benefits and the purpose of gifts and the different roles within the church. And, and he says this, Ephesians 4.11, And he himself, God himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So look at what Paul writes here in verse 12. God gave us these spiritual gifts and these leadership roles for one purpose, which was what? To make much of ourselves? To make our church the coolest, trendiest, most appealing place for the world to be a part of? To make life easier for us? No. One, in His grace, God gave us these things for the sake of equipping and building up the body of Christ so that we might, as a collective community, be enabled and well-equipped for the task that He's given us, namely proclaiming the message of truth and then making disciples of those who respond. It's so that by His working through us, we might be effective in that task. And, and look at how long this is going to go on for. Verse 13 says that this will go on until we all attain equal, completely unified place uh, of understanding of the knowledge of who Christ is. And that we'll all be equal in that. We're meant to continue to utilize the gifts God has given us to follow leaders and servants that he's given to lead the church until... End of that verse says, until we all reach a point of maturity and spiritual stature measured by Christ's fullness. Do you know when that day will be? 1 Corinthians 13 10 tells us, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. That day will come on the other side of these things and of this life when, when God has not just worked through Christ to forgive, bring, bring forgiveness to our lives, when the Holy Spirit has, has worked that process of sanctification every single day as we seek to follow Him, and we are standing face to face, finally, permanently glorified before God, and we, are, and we are done. We are there permanently before Him when we are standing face to face. In that day, the gifts won't be necessary anymore. Tongues, prophecy, messages of wisdom, knowledge, healing, service, any of those other things and any of those lists you find in 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12 or Ephesians 4, 1 Peter writes about you, But you know what will remain? The love that God has for us that we will find delight and satisfaction in. Paul says it there in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, 12, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I'll know fully and I'll be fully known. Come on, doesn't that get you fired up today? Am I by myself in that? 
you, you ever feel like you're not known? Like, man, I just feel so misunderstood. You ever come away from a conversation like, I know I clearly explained my position on that, but I just feel like nobody even heard me. Nobody even understood me in that, in that moment. Never again will we ever experience being misunderstood. We'll be fully known, seen by God. We'll experience that permanently. Man, a day is coming when all those good gifts of God, they're not going to be necessary anymore because the way we relate to Christ is on a whole other level qualitatively, face-to-face, the living Word of God that we just sang before the throne of God, that Him. We just sang about Him, the living one, the living Lamb, the risen Lamb. He's standing there before us, spotless in His righteousness. The unchangeable great I am. We're standing there, and we have the living word of God before us. We don't need words of knowledge or healing. We don't need tongues and interpretation. We don't need any of those things because everything is there, and we will marvel at it for eternity, perfectly satisfied by it. Man, for now, let me be clear. It's good and right that we exercise those gifts. We need them. They are good gifts. But love should go before us. And I'm wrapping up, don't worry. Love should go before us, even as we consider boasting or thinking too highly of ourselves or these gifts. Love should both go before us and mark us. I have a pastor friend I connected with back in New England in our days there. And many times we get together and we talk about leadership issues. And, and one of the things we came away with as, as we talk about how to effectively lead and pastor and shepherd people was the idea of self-awareness. And always trying to grow in like my own self-awareness, what I need to know about myself as I lead other people. And, uh, and this, this friend would always say, you know, I, I just feel like I, I'm a, people are intimidated by me, and I don't really know why. You know, it was a long time. People were intimidated, you know, and he, it's, it's funny because you, you get to know him, he's like, yeah, intimidated by him. But yeah, really, he can come across that way. Uh, and he said, for many years, I struggled with that until I came to the conclusion and then this kind of this revelation of, my personality enters the room about three seconds before the rest of me does. That's kind of how big of a personality he is, you know, loud and funny and just kind of larger than life personality. And that's exactly how our relationship between our spiritual gifts and love should be. I mean, especially how we love one another. Our love should permeate our lives. And almost like an incense, it should waft in before us and it should linger after we leave. Love should permeate everything that we do. So let me ask this morning, does love mark the life of the church? Does it mark your life? As you think about those ministries we listed out, are, do, do, are they carried out in love? Or is it just kind of an obligation? Does our routine reflect this? Because as, as much as Mark and Paul and I want to lead and serve and pray for us to will this thing to happen, the task of our church effectively loving the world around us, it's not just our job. It's the task of the family of faith together working this out. The church is made up of individuals, so I asked a couple of questions. Does your life reflect this kind of love? Does it reflect it in the home, at work, strangers on the street, with the rest of your brothers and sisters? I really wrestled with this question this week, and I think it's something we all need to contemplate. Is the mission of the church to make disciples being hindered because of a lack of love for others in my life? Am I a hindrance to the mission of the church because the level of love I'm demonstrating? This morning, let us just take some time to contemplate all of that. And as we do, we're going to have a time to respond in song and in prayer and, and through the table. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you this morning to partake in the table. But as we approach this, man, as you're a follower of Jesus, remember what Paul says. Remember these things. 1 Corinthians 11, not long ago we, we covered this. Paul writes that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed sat with his disciples and he took the bread and he broke it. He blessed it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And the gospel tell, 
tells us that at the end of the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We used to need animals. We used to need things to atone and cover over. This is the permanent new covenant in my blood. So do this in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this bread and take this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. So this morning, as we partake in this, remember that if you are in Christ, no matter what's gone on this week, no matter what's gone on in this season of life, God our Father looks at you and sees the righteousness of Christ. And he loves you. He delights in you. Rejoice in that today. Let it spur you on in your love. If you've never trusted in Jesus and all these things that we've been talking about this thing, if you've never entered in relationship with God and, and allowed Jesus to be the king of your life, we would love to talk to you this morning about how you can do that, what that means. We'd love to pray with you. Please come see Paul or Mark or me after the service. We would love just to have a conversation about that. But maybe you want prayer this morning. We're available for anything going on in your life you want prayer over. We would love to do that. It would be our privilege to do that. I close with this prayer and this encouragement to you this morning from 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Father, we give you our hearts. We surrender our lives to you. Fill us. We, we can't love on our own. Fill us with your love that we may love one another and love the world around us. Let us be effective in this. Let us be marked and known as a people who love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise God. This is a time that we can sing and respond in our hearts. Um, if you would like to pray with someone, feel free to do that and come to the table uh, for those who are believers. Uh, but stand and sing with us and let's reflect on all God's things. Yeah. 
our gifts with the heartbeat of love for you and for one another, um, that you would be glorified, that we would say, take our lives and let them be used for glory, for your name's sake. Lord, as we go into this week and all that we've heard, all that we've received this morning, Lord, I pray that um, we wouldn't walk out of this place and abandon this truth, but Lord, that it would be on our hearts and our minds in these next few days so that 
um, disciples are made, your kingdom is advanced um, because you loved us, so we love others. Lord, we give you our lives, we give you this church. Lord, we ask you to take it and use it for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great week.